Okay, so let me now introduce the next speaker. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Claire Gray. Uh, Claire Gray is a professor of chemistry at Cambridge University. Um, I will not go through all your bio, Claire, because I think we need, people are not waiting for that, but more for your talk. But I really would like just to point out a couple of points that you uh, made really uh, an international career, spending some part in the Netherlands, in uh, in, in the, the States, and, and back to uh, to UK. And, and also that uh, you are also not only a professor, but you are also a co-founder of a, a company which is named Niobolt. Not sure I pronounce it correctly. Um, but uh, so this company seeks to develop batteries for fast charging applications. And uh, we will enjoy your talk about uh, really the uh, importance of the uh, analytical approach, spectroscopic approaches to better understand what's going on at the, uh, the very atomic level in the, in the batteries. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Good. Well, I should also say that I first built my first battery with Mathieu Mocret and Jean-Marie Tarascon in Amiens. So that's where I actually physically got into a glove box and made one myself. Not sure how well they worked, but anyway, that's what you have students and postdocs for. Could someone turn my presentation on, please? Was it... Just technical issues. Okay. So what I want to do today is to tell you a little bit about the development of new spectroscopy methods. Uh, what they will be will be revealed as I go forward and then use them to try and look at battery degradation in full cells. So, you know, I don't think I need to tell this audience that in order to improve battery technology, we really need to understand what goes on at the all the way through from the atomistic level all the way through the full cell and one of the challenges if you want to look at degradation is it's a process that happens over very short time scales whether it's an electron transfer process all the way through to processes that may take many months to years to to manifest themselves and so that's the challenge to think about how we do this in the time scales uh, typically of phd students and postdocs and also within in the industrial context so I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in the UK by the Faraday Institution, which is this UK activity to bring together people to attack and grow a community in battery science. And for my sins, I lead the Battery Degradation Project, where a whole variety of different people with different techniques, from the experimentalist to the theorist to the modelers, come together to look at a full cell and how it degrades. And when we set this up, now, more than six years ago, we chose NMC811 because that was the sort of emerging new cathode material paired with graphite. And I want to talk a little bit about what we've done, particularly from the Cambridge perspective with others, to look at this specific problem. And this is now feeding on to also some of the things that I'm doing within the Big Mac project, particularly on LNOs. And if I have time, I'll get to that. So just to sort of walk through the outline of my talk. I want to start with the idea of local structure and dynamics, then think about processes that happen at the particle level, then talk about the electrode level, long-term cycling and degradation, and a little bit about particle cracking and other modes of degradation. So this is now rather old work done by my former postdoc, Katerina Merke, who looked at NMC in an ex situ mode by NMR spectroscopy. And what we do is we make lots of little batteries, we take them apart, and then we run NMR spectroscopy on them, all the way from the, um, the fully lithiated material to the, uh, the almost completely delithiated material. And over the years, we've developed a whole language to understand the NMR spectra, where we can interpret the peak positions in terms of what's known as a hyperfine shift, which is a measure of how much unpaired spin density starts off at the paramagnetic ions, goes through the bonds, and goes to the lithiums, which are our probe nuclei, but also where the action is. And what you can see, even if you don't love NMR as much as I do, is that the spectra change quite dramatically from the fully lithiated to the, the almost completely delithiated stage. So it's very broad at the, at the top because you, the lithium sees a whole variety of different local configurations coming from the different paramagnetic ions. 
At the top, it's mostly nickel-4, which is a diamagnetic system. And so it becomes simpler because you're just seeing the paramagnetic manganese 4 plus. The thing that I want to focus on is, though, is the middle, where apparently the spectra look a lot simple, simpler. And this is due to something called uh, exchange narrowing, where if the lithium ions are hopping very fast, in the NMR timescale, you get an averaging of the broad signal. And you can look at that by heating the samples up, heat the samples up, the ions move faster, and the phenomena gets more pronounced. So this is a classic uh, signature of line narrowing due to mobility. And of course, the way that the lithium ions hop in, the, in between the layers of a, a layered structure has been well um, established for a number of years. You get hops from octahedral sites through the tetrahedral sites, the octahedral sites in these structures. As you pull lithiums out of the structures, you create more vacancies and the mobility increases. And so we can develop, or Katerina developed, a model for extracting uh, the hopping frequencies from the changes of the line widths. And from looking at this as from a function of temperature, you can get the activation barrier. And so the bottom line is between about X equals 0.25 and X equals 0.75, you have very fast lithium ion hopping in the layers. So how do you rationalize this? So those of us who work on these layered cathode materials are very familiar with the phenomena of the spacings between the C layers, so that define the interlayer spacings going up first as you pull out the lithium. And then there's this dramatic collapse at about x equals 0.65, as the layers come on top of each other, you can decompose that to the collapse in, in the lithium layers and the collapse of the transition metal layers. And you can see that the lithium layers collapse at about 0.75, and that's when the lithium motion starts to slow down. So the layers are coming in and they're clamping the lithiums in place. So this is a little cartoon made by uh, my former postdoc, Chao Chu, that I wanted to show. He's an ex, um, he's an alum of Uppsala University who came to my lab for a number of years, and I'll talk about his work later. I just wanted to make put one other point. So you've got this concept of the layers moving up and down, but you've also got the fact that if you hop from octahedral site to octahedral site via a tetrahedral site, there's a very close contact with the metal layer below and above, and when those metal layers um, contain ions that are charged to 4+, plus, then the activation barrier increases because of this very short contact. And this was work that um, I was involved in many years ago. So the point then is, is this generalizable? So this is work now where we extended this to an NCA, where you see exactly the same phenomena that after about 0.8, the lithium mobility increases dramatically. So then the question becomes, how does the lithium mobility affect the intercalation mechanism? So what we needed to do to ask that question was to, um, to answer that question rather, was to do some method development. So I'm going to step back now and talk about a new approach that I've been working with in collaboration with my colleague in the Cavendish lab or physics lab in Cambridge, Dr. Akshay Rao. So if you think about a single particle experiment, the typical way that you would look at how that worked would be to write a proposal, go to a synchrotron, shine some sort of X-ray source at it, try and find that particle and look at what happens. Now, there are many challenges, the most biggest one being that you have to get beam time and you have very limited access to that. So you can't really look at lots of geometries and different cells. And so what actually I did was to think about, and this was coming from the solar PV field, was to try and look at optical methods to try and look at very fast processes. And he was looking at how polarons moved in, in lead-based um, perovskites. And so what he did was to borrow the, from the work of the um, fluorescent microscopy community where they come in with a laser or now even an LED light, you come in, you hit a particle and you get scattering off the particle. And so the scattering is going to be proportional to the polarizability and you will see a contrast between two different media. So the medium in this case would be the particle and the electrolyte around it. So this was a story of something that we set up just before the pandemic. To keep it simple, we took a, an L cell, so a, a cell used typically for Raman microscopy. We shone a, a laser through it to an electrode. And just because I wanted a very large, well-characterized particles, the obvious ones were lithium cobalt oxide, and you can see the lithium cobalt oxide basal planes distributed in this um, carbon matrix. And so these are some of the first images of LCO using this technique, or ISCAT, not a particularly nice name, but there, there we are. 
Uh, we have to live with it. And you can see that what you're doing is focusing on the basal planes of these particles, and you're going down by the first 300 nanometers. So this is not a surface technique. It's, a, it's pretty bulk, it put much bulk into the structure. So let's now look at this image that we collected just before lockdown in 2020. So this is the sort of first um, ISCAT image showing you the sol now the solid solution regime. Watch out now because you can see the ordering tra transition at Li.5. You'll see it whipping through the sample here. And then we come back. There's the ordering transition again, the solid solution. It's becoming um, darker as you're pulling lithiums out and the scattering is changing. And then you're going to see this two-phase reaction. So this is almost classic textbook stuff that those of you who've done batteries for many years sort of know this as the prototype lith um, intercalation material. So let's unpick this a lot more. Uh, so we were inspired by some of the work of Martin Bazan's group at MIT, thinking about different mechanisms by which you pull lithium out of materials. And you can distinguish between two types, the shrinking core or the intercalation wave. So the shrinking core is one where you pull the lithiums out from the edge of the particle and the core gradually collapses in, in itself. So this is the metal insulator transition. It's a two-phase reaction. The other one on the way back is a different mechanism, and this is called the intercalation wave. And what happens here is that you have a nucleation event, in this case only one, on the edge of the particle, and the, the new phase grows across the particle. And so we can visualize this really beautifully. And then lockdown happened. So my former postdoc, Quentin Jacquet from Jean-Marie Tarascon's group, had plenty of time to learn how to do continuum modeling. And so what he did was to model these two phenomena and examining, again, two phases, one that has very high lithium mobility, which is the delithiated phase, and the original lithium-rich phase, where the lithiums are essentially stuck. And then you can start to rationalize why this happens. So if you just do a thought experiment, the pink particles have very poor lithium mobility. You pull the lithiums out on the edge, and you form this blue phase. And then it's easier to keep on pulling the lithiums out from the blue phase, and you get a shrinking core. On the way back, you nucleate the pink phase with poor lithium mobility, the lithium can't get through that phase. So they come in through the edges of the particle, they add to this phase and it moves across. And so this is a balance between how fast the lithium ions go in, which is J, and then also the transport in the blue phases. And you can extract the diffusion coefficients through this. Okay, so that's lithium cobalt oxide. Just, just for the crystallographers in the audience, just wanted to point out that the ordering transition at Li.5, which you can see often in the DQDV plots, which you can't always um, pick it up by any other signatures, is seen beautifully in these um, processes. So this is the transition from a ronbohedral structure to a monoclinic structure. And so depending on how it nucleates, you can actually form examples, and this is one I showed you in the first slide, where you have three domains in one particle, which is the way you can accommodate a monoclinic structure within a rhombohedral environment, or sometimes it can even be a single domain in the particle. So that's sort of quite interesting to explore why and when that happens. Okay, so let's get back now to some um, NMCs and move beyond LCO. So I just wanted to talk about this one question of um, why why you have a large irreversible loss in an NMC or an NCA particle. So you pull out the lithiums, and when you try and put the lithiums back in again, you can't manage to put them all in. And so this is, was shown by um, others, um, including um, Stan Whittingham, to be a kinetic phenomena. So you can heat the materials up, and if you heat them up, you can get some more lithiums back in again, or you can put a long voltage hold and shove the lithium back in again. So is this something that we can look at um, by our ISCAT? So let's just sort of examine this phenomenon in a little bit more detail with X-ray diffraction. So if this is now an NCA, if you pull the lithiums out, you put them back in again, you can get, if you hold for a long time, most of the lithiums back in the structure. But if you try and do an, a diffraction refinement, and this is done by Anton Grenier, who was um, supervised by Karina Chapman, um, you can see that the diffraction using a solid solution model, so a single phase, has a very high R factor at the beginning of charge. But if you assume then it's a two phase reaction, then you actually get a much lower R factor. So what you're seeing is in a material that has the signature electrochemically of being a solid solution, and that's what it is thermodynamically, it forms a metastable two phase reaction as seen by X ray diffraction. So can we just walk through why this happens? So just using the ideas we, I just developed from the LCO case, you can imagine a scenario where you have a very poor lithium mobility phase, 
you start to pull the lithiums out of the structure to form phase two. The ions are moving fast in lithium two. It's easier to pull more lithiums out of that phase than is to pull out of the phase one. And so you develop this metastable two-phase reaction. And this is just to show that when you go back, you just remind people you can put the lithiums back in again, and you can see that by NMR spectroscopy. So uh, we published this, and then a few, few uh, uh, months or a year later, there was some work coming out of Will Choose Group with Martin Bazant that sort of said that some of these heterogeneities could be at a particle level, not at the single particle level that we proposed in our original paper. So the question is, could we do ISCAT? And these are now a work of Chow Chu and Alice Merriweather looking at NMC particles. And so what you're looking at is now a whole field of view. So we've come back out of lockdown. We've improved our set, set up so we can now look at multiple particles at the same time. And so this is, again, looking at the basal plane of an NMC particle. And you can see things are happening. So let's dig now, down now and see what's actually happening at the individual particle. And we'll do something called a differential image, which is the image at one point and then you subtract the, the initial point from the, the time point you're interested in, which gives you a much better contrast. And if I just play that again, um, you can see that you, these particles develop these sort of cores, and then they gradually fill. Uh, for those who are interested in, there's no evidence of an H2, H3 phase transition, as which you'd expect. So there's no sort of underlying polarizability or um, electronic structures around that point too. So let's tease the first part apart. So this is the very first delithiation. And you can see at the single particle level, there really is a clear signature of this metastable two-phase front behavior that we were predicting based on our X-ray diffraction. And to show that this is a metastable phenomena, you can stop, you can pull some lithium out, you can let it relax, and you can see it reaches equilibrium, albeit in a very slow process, showing you again that this is metastable. So let's just think again why this is happening. I've sort of touched on this before. You start off with a phase uh, initially that's very poorly conducting because it's full of lithium. You start pulling lithium out of the edges. The mobility increases because you've got vacancies in the structure. It continues to be easier to pull stuff out of the red phase and the white phase, and it grows. And you have, again, this core, core shell model for a different, you know, this is, an example where you have a single phase that is metastable two-phase, the lithium cobalt oxide was a true two-phase reaction thermodynamically. So there are subtle differences in the, in the kinetics and thermodynamics, but, look, but for remarkably related phenomena. And so just to sort of uh, check that we're not um, totally mad, if you go to higher rates, these phenomena get more pronounced, again, suggesting this is a metastable kinetic phenomena. And at the end of discharge, you can... Um, put the lithium in, but it really takes you a long time. You form a sort of ring of the poorly lithiated phase. Remember, that's the white phase. And it takes a long time for that to, to diffuse into the bulk because of the kinetic limitations of getting through that surface phase. OK, so then uh, to try and understand this and pull out more information, I turn to collaborations with my colleagues Norman Fleck and Vikram Deshpande, who are um, um, continuum modelers and mechanical um, modelers too, to try and understand this. And so what post, the postdoc Shri uh, did was to develop a, a model of our particles. And so what he did to put into the continuum modeling was to take the chemical potential from the, the, the voltage uh, capacity curves, and then he took the, the lithium conductivity from the NMR spectra. So he converted that into hopping frequencies. And he took the sort of most optimistic or the fastest hopping that we had extracted from NMR. And so he developed this model where he could beautifully simulate this core shell type behavior that we'd seen experimentally. And just to sort of talk, think a little bit more about this model, what he was able to show was that you get as a function of time. So this is a, the, the modeling of the concentrations versus position in the particle. So you can see at the beginning of time, you've got um, a lot of delithiation. It's still pretty lithiated in the center. And then you gradually sort of delithiate the center. And if you plot then the, uh, the extent of delithiation at the center of the particle, which is what's shown here, as a function of time, you get this very uh, pronounced phenomenon of a lag, and then suddenly it delithiates. And so you have quite a good fit with the experiment. And what the sort of you need to do as a reality check is that if you have a constant diffusion, this is, uh, you don't actually get that same lag phenomena. So these are simulations where we're looking at different diffusivities to show that... Um, 
you cannot model this lag unless you actually have a change in diffusivities as a function of state of charge. Um, so then I just um, wanted to point out that uh, in order to get that fit, we actually had to take not the highest lithium diffusivities that we got by NMR, we had to scale them down by a factor of about 3.5. And that was due to a number of assumptions we made in the models, um, primarily that the NMR had chosen the most optimistic uh, line width to do the modeling. And so um, what these continuum models do in combination with ISCAT is really allow you to get the diffusion coefficients at the single particle level. And so I just want to show you some preliminary experiments where we're really trying to explore that in more detail. And so what we're trying to do is to do GITT, galvanostatic intermittent titration experiments in ISCAT. And those of you who do this analysis know that it's very difficult to get the diffusion coefficients from that method. You get an apparent diffusion coefficient that depends on your assumption of how fast the ions have to diffuse after you've given the, the constant current pulse. And so this is an experiment now where we're giving five constant current pulses in, in the first um, at rates of about 2C uh, to extract the first 0.1 lithium. And so let's just look at that. So this is the first current pulse. And you can see you put a little lithium on the You pulled a little bit of lithium out from the edges of the particle. But that particle you know, is taking a long time to equilibrate. And then you're going to put the next um, current in, and it's going to be slightly better, but it's still going to take a long time. So I want to now in individually analyze each step of the process. So in step one, this is the one I've just shown you. This is the current pulse. You pull lithium out of the edge of the particle, and then you sit there for an hour. And even after an hour, it hasn't reached equilibrium. Then you pull the next set of lithium out. You can see in the current pulse, again, you're pulling lithium off the edge. And it takes you about an hour to reach equilibrium. Then you take the next one out. You can do it now in 400 seconds. You can reach equilibrium. The next one you can do in 140 seconds. And then um, the last one you can get at about 60 seconds. And so what we've developed now is this optical GITT method where you can really start to look at the changes of diffusivity that come at that beginning of the first removal of about 0.1 lithiums per transition metals. So this is the regime we're getting it, and this is the comparison with GITT. So what we want to do now is to use this to try and explore whether there are different diffusion coefficients at different particles and try and decouple the effects from how fast the ions get into the material, J, and the diffusion coefficient. OK, so what about long-term cycling in the full cell? So these are some really nice uh, experiments done by Wes Dose, where he tried to unpick a lot of the degradation phenomena electrochemically. And so we started off, this is now five or six years ago, looking at NMC811 graphite full cells with no additives so that we could then explore how the additives improved uh, or stopped the degradation process. And so what De Wes did was to use a slippage analysis where he was able to pull apart the processes that um, happened on the anode and the cathode by using the DQDVs, sorry, the DVDQs, uh, which, unlike the QDVs, are additive. So you can run, uh, under slow conditions, a, a half cell for the anode and a half cell for the cathode. You can get the DVDQs and you can add them up and you can work out what each of those uh, inflection points are on, on the full cell. And then that allows you to then compute the slippage. So the slippage is how much the, um, the capacity loss drifts due to loss of capacity on the cathode that's sitting now on the anode. And what he showed was in a full cell, if you just continue to cycle with a 4.2 volt upper cutoff, the uh, degradation tracks a linear uh, relationship between the loss of capacity and the slippage until you get to about 312. Now, there's, and then suddenly the slippage starts to increase, indicating that there's another degradation process on the cathode. Now, there's nothing particularly magical about 312 cycles. What's going on is that at that point, you have so much slippage that the anode now can no longer be fully delithiated. And so instead of delithiating all the way down to stage one graphite, the fully lithiated graphite, you only get to stage two. And you can see this beautifully in the X-ray diffraction measurements done by uh, Chao Chu at uh, Diamond, um, that after about 300 cycles, you no longer see the stage one 
diffraction peak. And so what that means then in the full cell, even though you've got a 4.2 volt cut off or cut off, you're now pushing the cell up to 4.3 volts and there's a new degradation process. So then what Wes did was to pull the whole thing apart and say, let's look at the degradation in EC cells, let's look at the degradation in EMC cells, so cyclic versus linear cells, and compare them with the, this full uh, electrolyte, the YP57. And he was able to show that you've got significantly more degradation in the cells containing EC. So the degradation was seen by signatures, for example, as such as the carbon dioxide evolution, which is a signature of EC degradation. It was also seen by things like a parasitic current where you hold the cell at high voltages or increasingly high voltages and you look at the, the parasitic degradation current. Oh, and so just sort of should point out that these excel, the experiments are done with LTO so that you can decouple or you can assume that you're not going to have to worry about the graphite processes. So um, these are things that many people know, but I just want to point some of this out for people in this audience who haven't uh, intimately followed these processes for many years. Um, so as you increasingly hold the cells at higher voltages, again, EC cells versus e EMC cells, you get a, a massive increase in charge transfer resistance in the EC cells. You get this transformation of the surface layer from uh, a, a layered structure to this rock salt layer, and then it, you can see also these intermediate sort of half mixed layers between the two. And so all of these processes are much more prevalent in EC cells. So then he did something else that was quite clever, and that was to try and cycle the battery in different ways and decouple the different processes. So he did three things. He did a full cycle between um, 2.5 and 4.2. Uh, in a full cell, so I'm um, pushing up to about 4.3 volts in, in the half cell. Then he, so he went up progressively to higher voltages, or then he, or he simply held at different voltages, or he cycled at higher voltages. And the, the regime that he chose at, at high voltages was the regime where you get this significant collapse of the C layer that I showed you earlier on my talk. So the, the point of doing this high voltage cycling was to ask the question, if you've got a particle that's expanding and contracting, constantly for many, many cycles, does that cause more cracking and more degradation? And so he kept the time constant between these three experiments, but he showed surprisingly that you were going to have much more degradation if you actually did the full cycling between the lower and upper cutoff voltages, even though you spent less time at high voltages where the degradation process occurred. And then, um, okay, so that I want to unpick why that might be. So there's been a lot of work. I've already touched on this idea of cracking being important. And if you look at a polycrystalline material, inevitably, because of the very large changes in the C parameters, you will get significant cracking between the individual primary particles in your grain. And you can see this, and there are multiple um, studies in the literature. I've picked on this one here, and this is work in by, done by the UCL group using CT. Um, X-ray CT, and you can see very clearly the development of these cracks, which is much more pronounced if you push to high voltages. So the, what Wes did then was to pull the whole thing out with his DVA differential voltage analysis and work out the different types of modes depending on the nature of the cycling. And so if you just have a voltage hold, all you get is slippage at the anode. So all this junk that comes off at the cathode causes more degradation on the anode. If you um, start cycling, you get not you get the slippage, you get an impedance growth on the NMC, and you also got a you get a degradation mechanism of the NMC itself. And then if you have the final one where you just have high voltage capacity cycling, you get an additional degradation process on the cathode itself. So let's unpick some more of these different processes. So I'm going to go back now and talk about the work of Chao Chu who, using this uh, long-duration experiment at Diamond, was able to cycle the graphite full cells, NMC full cells, for a very long time. And so what he saw, if we just focus on the 003 peak here, which is the one that measures this collapse of the C layers, he showed that after multiple cycles, it no longer collapsed as much. In fact, it sort of got stuck at the top of the fully expanded regime. And so to analyze that, what he did was to pull the cell out. He then rebuilt the cell with lithium metal. He took it to the top of charge to 4.3 volts, and he showed that it was no longer a single phase. In fact, he could decompose it into three components. So this is obviously a simplistic uh, 
decomposition, but it just the one that's good to start with. He had one that behaved like the normal phase, which we called the, the active material. Then the fatigue phase was the one that got stuck and didn't collapse. And there was sort of an intermediate phase. And then he went back and periodically every month or so, we got a chance to look at this battery. And so we were able to track the growth of the fatigue phase as a function of cycling. And by the time you got to about 900 cycles, pretty much all of this phase is fatigued. In other words, it doesn't want to collapse. And so then in collaboration with uh, Leila Mady and her group in Liverpool, we were able to look at how the, the phases evolved with, as a function of cycling. And so what you see in the pristine material, if you look at it with high resolution TM, you can measure the spacings between the layers. As the materials age, you can see both open channels. So this is the edge of the particle where you can see the layers go all the way out to the, the surface or the electrolyte. But you could also see these blocked channels that had rock salt on them. And what was interesting was that the spacings of the rock salt structure actually match the spacings at the top of charge before that collapse. And so you get an absolute perfect uh, matching between the closed channels and the rock salt spacings. And so what Chow proposed was that in the initial material, the materials can expand and contract. But when you start to put a rock salt structure on the material, this rock salt structure has a spacing that matches the open structure at the top of the, this, its most expanded state. And then that rock salt structure sort of pins it and really prevents that collapse. And so at least that's one mechanism for why at the when you've got such a thick rock salt structure, it's very difficult to pull the, more lithiums out of the material. So I really want to return back to this question. Why does a full cycle trigger, trigger so much more aging than just the hold high voltages when you get a lot of, of degradation? And so to look at this, um, a former postdoc, Yian Seymour, who was at Imperial and now at Aberdeen, looked at the thermodynamics associated with um, oxygen loss from the structures. And what he showed was that um, there are two mechanisms. Reaction one is a direct oxygen evolution reaction. Reaction two is that coupling between an EC oxidation and an oxygen loss. And the, the two things in this graph to point out is what one, this one is a much more favorable reaction. So the EC actively drags the oxygen out of the lattice and is itself oxidized. And then the other thing is that the, both reactions become a lot more favorable as you go from the nickel nominally three plus to nickel four plus in NiO2. Then the other thing to think about is what about the activation barrier for it? And what's interesting is if you're at high states of charge, if you're at NiO2, then the activation barrier to move the vacancies, which is what you need if you want to go from pulling vacancies out from the surface to form a rock salt structure, is very high. But if you go down to Li to lithium nickel oxide, so the reduced stage, the vacancy migration energy drops. And the same thing actually happens for the nickel migrate migration. So you can see it's easy to form a tetrahedral nickel at high voltages, but it's very difficult to move those nickels. And so what the mechanism that we have, at least that partially explains this, is that at high voltages, you pull out the lithiums, the nickels drop into the tetrahedral sites, but you've got to go down to low voltage to actually grow the rock salt phase. And that's why this sort of cycling backwards and forwards is critical. And I just want to quickly talk about the uh, why this happens. This is work of Annalena, who's been um, doing a whole series of DFT calculations to look at the oxygen partial charges as a function of state of charge. And what she shows is that most of the action comes from the oxygen and not from the nickel. The nickel charges remain very similar from nickel oxide to NiO2. And what I'm saying is not an oxygen redox process. What I'm saying is the change of hybridization between the nickels and oxygens changes so dramatic between the formal two plus state and the formal uh, four plus state that most of the action is on the oxygen. And then the people then say, well, how do you then account for these large shifts in the nickel K edge? So this would be a way that uh, would be normally the signature of nickel involvement. But you can do DFT calculations and you can show even with these types of mechanisms, the nickel still shifts. And this is because you have very diff significant changes in the nickel oxygen bond lengths because of this oxidation process. And that causes the edge shifts in the zanes. So then let's reflect on how does the oxygen then come off. So it, inspired by work of um, 
Hubert Gasteiger, who showed that you could get single oxygen if you just heat these materials up. She then calculated the, um, the, the mechanism oxygen release. And so this little cartoon shown here where the oxygen comes together, it forms a peroxide, and then it disproportionates off into the structure. And it's this coming together to form the peroxide, and then it's release that explains why you get singular oxygen and not triplet oxygen. So you have a um, singular oxygen is the paired state, and so you need to form a, a, a singlet peroxide, which is then removed. So then what happens to this oxygen? So then my former uh, student, Didi, did a very detailed analysis with um, our favorite technique, NMR, to look at all of the gory degradation projects. Uh, products that are formed. I'm not going to go through all of this because it's really um, less inspirational to look at NMR peaks, but the bottom line is that there are two processes, one below 4.3 volts and at above 4.3 volts you start to see CO2, CO and oxygen evolution which then creates a whole series of new degradation processes. Below 4.3 volts you just see degradation to form BC. Um, so can we understand those mechanisms? And so what we did was to, um, to actually create singlet oxygen uh, using rose bengal dye. We then uh, reacted with, so we created, um, we took singlet oxygen created from O17. We could then follow the reaction products by using oxygen NMR. And we could generally, sh uh, we could show quite clearly that you formed water. And this was then consistent with this mechanism based on others, including his Huber Gas Tiger's work, to generate uh, the water in this reaction. So then just to summarize, at high voltages, you form um, the reaction water, which triggers a whole series of degradation project, uh, products, which then cross over and produce extra slippage at the, the, the anode. And, and that's why you get these new signatures of degradation above 4.3 volts. So just a sort of word of caution, uh, we've also looked at the effect of metal dissolution, and this is some beautiful work of my former student, Jen Allen, who looked at the effect of metal dissolution on the NMR spectra. And one of the things that just for the NMR people in the audience you have to be aware of is that when you put these paramagnetic ions in the solution, you start to uh, broaden your peaks significantly, so you have to worry about what you're looking at. And what she showed very beautifully was that this broadening was worse for some of the components you were looking for. So this is an example where she's putting manganese into a solution containing PO2F2OH. Or, and this is one of the degradation products of PF6 and water. But if you have a lot of manganese around, you can't see it. And the same is true of a whole series of other proton degradation products. And then with Conrad, uh, who working in the Aachen group, we did low temperature ESR and double uh, double resonance experiments, and she was able to show that the manganese was directly coordinated to the POF2 minus in its first coordination shell, and you can see this sort of in these 2D cross peaks, and that's why it disappears in the room temperature NMR spectra. So the manganese is very strongly coordinated, this particular additive and degradation product. Um, and you can actually remove them by adding either solvents that bind to the manganese ions or Li3PO4 that actually takes the manganese out of solution. And you can go on and you can then quantify from some of these effects how many paramagnetic ions you have in the solution. So I just want to sort of touch on a few, one more thing before we end, and this is the idea of, of cracking. So I've been talking about polycrystalline materials, and then what we did next in the next phase of the project was to move on to the single crystals. And of course, uh, Jeff Dahn's work has really inspired uh, a lot of this work in the community by showing that you could get millions of miles if you went to a single crystal. And he's shown, uh, and he and now others have shown these sort of lovely uh, cross-sectional images that show after multiple cycles, there's really very little evidence in a single crystal of cracking. Yet there are other reports in the literature that do show failure mechanisms of single crystals, and particularly these sort of slippage type events of the particles that are driven at high voltages and also at fast charging. So I went back to our continuum modelers. So this is, again, the work of Shri with Norman um, Fleck and Vikram Despande and, and Dave Hall, who was the program manager in the, in the, the grant um, at the time. And we took our particle that we studied by ICECAT and then we looked at the question of what are the stresses that are created as the materials expand and contract. And I'm going to walk you through this um, sort of movie, which may or may not play. It's chosen not to play. I have time to show it. 
Okay. Uh, come on, movie. Yes, here. Okay, so the movie has lots of color changes. They were the most incomprehensible color changes ever. But the point of your you're seeing is that a lot of the the stresses are at the surface, and then they um, they move into the bulk depending on the state of charge. And let's just you can look at be distracted by the movie, but then just look at what's going on here. So this is the the plot of the surface, and this is the, the center or the bulk. And the, the bigger issue is the major stresses occur at the surface of the particle. So that's you know not too surprising because you're because of this change in the diffusivity, you're pulling the lithium out, and you're getting this significant concentration gradients between the surface and the bulk that I showed you earlier on from the ice caps. The question, so this is again shown here. Maybe this is easier to follow. So these are the um, the, the the stress starting at the beginning and then continuing. So initially, so this is the um, edge of the particle, this is the center. As you pull something out, you can see the concentration changes across the particle and it flips at the point where the diffusion coefficient has started to get very large. But the biggest question is, is this enough to cause cracking? And so what he looked at was he created a little crack here. So this is sort of a little indentation that's shown here. And then he explored was with a mode one fracture, so it, the crack going in this um, course in this direction, did you generate enough stress? And the answer is no. Unless you cycle fast enough or you have very large particles, your single crystal NMCs should not crack. So then to sort of think about this further, we looked at some indentation experiments. So this is now um, actual physical measurements and they're done by Joe Stallard. He comes in with a, an indenter, he compresses an electrode of particles and you change the substrate and the hardness of the substrate and depending on the hardness, you can get the different um, mechanical force. And you can then look at the images and you can count how many fractured particles you are, have and how many particles of slippage or slips rather, not slippage, to be clear. And you can then see that you get very different numbers as a function of state of charge. And so what he was able to do was to then quantify, this is now the force you need to push the particles this way. And you can see that on delithiation, that force d decreases, and it's a very low force, even at the fully lithiated phase. And so putting the two together, it really becomes clear that the images that you see of these slipped particles are not coming from the cycling. They're coming from the calendaring processes or particles hitting each other as everything is expanding and contracting in the electrode. OK, so I just want to now in the last image move now from uh, the Faraday project to a Big Mac project where we're looking at LNOs and just show you an iSCAT image of um, LNO. So this is nominally a single crystal. This is just literally for the movie, nothing more. And what you're seeing is what you think is a single crystal. This is not the basal plane. This is now the 0, 1, 2 plane. So this is where the lithiums are going in. It's not behaving as a perfect single crystal. In fact, there's some really weird stuff in the H2 to H3 transition where you've got a very large change in the cell parameters. And you can see this more clearly in the um, the the discharge at the top. So this is the, um, the, the H3 to H2 transition. There's a whole series of zigzag in the structures. And so to analyze what's going on, these are some electron backscattering diffraction images. And you can see this particle that was looking nice before it started has really cracked. But what's more interesting is if you look at the pole images and the pole figures, you can sort of unpick the planes in this material, and you can see this, this is not a single crystal. It's got a grain boundary between the layers in this direction and layers in this direction. And that grain boundary is actually pinning the whole thing together. So cracking is not happening at the grain boundary. In fact, it's just actually forcing the cracking of the layers because of that stress. And so this is what we're now looking at in more broad context, looking at different particles and trying to understand how the non-single crystals of the single crystals or the defects within single crystals impact degradation. And so with that, I will end the probably the most complicated talk of the, 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 the of the day by saying we've looked at lots of different things. The sort of new things in terms of the spectroscopy have been these optical measurements that allowed us to take the local phenomena that are coming out from the NMR, like the lithium diffusion and the local environment, to really unpick 
what's going on at the single particle and understand different phase mechanisms. And then by a series of very careful electrochemical cycling, coupled with uh, DEMS, NMR, and TM, SEM, we really unpicked a whole series of different degradation mechanisms of NMC. And now, of course, we're putting additives in the picture to try and tick off and work out which of these processes are diminished because of the additives. And then finally, we looked at it, a lot of modeling. And so on that, I'm going to end. I mentioned most of people along the way. I want to mention my funding from the Faraday Institution, from the EU, and from EPSRC, and uh, Alice Merriweather, who's really pushed the ISCAT, um, has been sort of instrumental on this. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much.